SA300 Canary Island Special on KSET is powered by Frost Bank and Sierra Cars Trucks and RVs and the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. 300 years ago, a journey began. A king in Spain would send forth a small group of pioneers from the Canary Islands. 56 of them would set sail. Come ashore in Mexico, and then on to a spot in the western wilderness we now call San Antonio. The year, 1731. In the three centuries since, a city has emerged, forever changing what we call Texas today. This is the story of the birth of San Antonio. Hello, and welcome to the proverbial ground zero of all that we call San Antonio. These stones set in place by a Canary Island settler all the way back in the early 1700s. The stones becoming the bedrock for our community, our city, and all of Bear County, which at the time would reach all the way over to Wyoming, down to the Rio Grande, and over to Louisiana. It was the job of the King of Spain to settle all of this. Problem was, the King of France thought it might be his as well. So that is why Spain decided to send Canary Islanders, 56 of them, to settle this area and forever changed what we call the Wild West. There was already the Mission de Valero, which we now call the Alamo. And there were Indians in the area that called this area home. But in the early 1700s, all Spain had to protect its New World investment from invaders was just a few soldiers. That's it. And back then, the king knew that was not enough. It's not till 1731 that Spain then says, we want a town. We're going to start a town, an actual civic settlement. And that uh, is when the Canary Islanders came. They begin their little village and their church, which now we know as San Fernando. Father David Garcia is a preeminent expert on San Antonio's first missions and the church as well. He takes particular pride in his success story restoring and renovating San Fernando Cathedral. His efforts to do so this century could be likened to how the Canary Islanders went about it way back when. Of course, it starts off with the King of Spain who gave like 5,000 pesos, and then it comes down to the governor who gave like 100, and then it comes down, and then maybe the priest gave 10 pesos. And then you have people giving a cow and people giving so much wheat or so much, uh, you know, of their produce. And, and it was the first capital campaign of San Antonio. <laughs> and I thought, oh, there's my inspiration. <laughs> Indeed, with few resources, the Canary Islanders built San Fernando Cathedral, the cornerstone to not only the city of San Antonio, but the center of New Spain, by which maps of Texas would be drawn for decades, and Main Plaza, what would be the soul of the city, just like the plaza you would find in most Spanish colonial cities around the world. 1980, um, they completely uh, renovated. Um, in the back is the original structure. So when we talk about the plaza, the plaza would actually have been a little bit bigger than what yeah. it is today. Anthony Delgado is a Canary Island historian for the San Antonio Canary Island Descendants Association. To find the San Fernando they created, you don't go to the front of the church, but rather to the back, the part facing City Hall, which was once the entrance to the Spanish Army's Presidio. He says for all the descendants did, there's scant evidence at sites like San Fernando, a thought that upsets him and others greatly. Here is where there should be something denoting that this is the original structure that our ancestors built and it's almost 286 years ago when they landed that they said, you know, we need, we need that church. If you're looking for a historical plaque, you'll find at least one in all of San Antonio. It's across the street in front of the Bear County Courthouse on a busy street opposite Main Plaza. Delgado and his fellow descendants feel it's just not enough that their story of their church, their plaza, and the city's original builders needs to be fully told. 
But once I started doing my research, I found that of the 16 families that came for them were my grandparents. In fact, Joanna Herrera can trace many ancestors back to that time of New Spain and even to Juan Zaguin himself. She says, however, since there are so few Canary Island memorials in the city or even mentions of it in San Antonio public schools, it's a bit upsetting. And I'm as much surprised as I am as disappointed because now they know 50 years ago we could have chalked it up to not knowing. But now that we know, why not um, tell the people? This is something that San Antonio should be proud of. There is a movement underway to get the entire Canary Island story told in Texas schools. At least during the tricentennial, that movement is going to get spurred on into San Antonio classrooms. Coming up, we'll tell you more about what's being planned for San Antonio's biggest year. Hold on to your hat. It's going to be huge. In 2016, San Antonio city leaders as well as business leaders made the trek all the way to the Canary Islands. The idea was to personally invite the leaders of Spain and the islands, as well as the people, to come to our city in 2018 and celebrate the tricentennial. We went along to see for ourselves the inspiration for some of our architecture, some of our tourism business, and in some cases, some of our lifestyle. Even as you're flying in, you're struck by the fact that these islands are the result of a volcano built on the ocean floor thousands of years ago. The dark brown landscape with towering mountains contrasting with blue sea and beachfront. It's like a scene out of Casablanca at times. Then add in a bit of Monte Carlo here, tropical jungle there, a good dose of fishing village, meeting International Shipping Center sprinkled all around. It's African, Spanish, and European, all melting together in a place with great weather year-round. There's more sun than rain, and that's why the people come here all the time, all types of tourists. It's beautiful, divine. No one will ever forget coming here for vacation. And yes, the tourism industry flourishes here too. Take the 15th century town of La Laguna, San Antonio's delegation is treated to tours of beautiful palaces, antiquities, and given lessons on how to blend 400-year-old architecture into a 21st century economy. This place is situated like 560 meters high above sea level. So in this way, they could prevent the attacks of the pirates, but they were a lot in those days. It's so old, some of their places here, buildings are already 400 years old, but two, it also gives us a, a view into the difference of how they take care of them, how they use them for their whole local, uh, all the locals and all the visitors. And to know that here in uh, La Laguna, they've increased their tourism here. And almost everywhere our delegation went, we were told they were like our own missions of late. All UNESCO World Heritage Sites filled with eager visitors. Except that is for the beaches. Even though they are not World Heritage Sites, they had a lot of visitors, but it likely had a lot more to do with the fact that these beaches are clothing optional. Tenerife is famous for its stunning views, including the views on the sand. By the way, the San Antonio delegation did not go there. It all begs the question, why did those 16 Canary Island families leave all this to come to the New World? Well, it was a matter of timing. Yeah, the whole philosophy of life was completely different. There was a lot of hunger, no work, different situation. A rough period in Canary Island history that the King of Spain recognized much to our benefit in Texas. And speaking of the King of Spain, among the travels of our San Antonio delegation, we were given an up-close look at some of the most beautiful buildings in the world. Breathtaking frescoes and palaces and museums, all serving as a backdrop to one thing the invitation for Spain's royal family and governmental leaders to join us for our tricentennial celebration. 
the mayor uh, and the county judge have extended invitations to the, their royal highnesses, uh, the king and queen of Spain. And we are keeping our fingers crossed that they will uh, be able to accept the invitation and come to San Antonio in the tricentennial year. It would be a huge get for the city's big party, but not necessarily the biggest. If prayers are answered, the Pope himself will accept an invitation to come, making the 2018 celebration even more divine. The party of the century, or rather three centuries, would not be possible without one man, the Canary Island Mason, who was given the huge task of building a municipality in the place we now call San Antonio. But his life, his loves, and his infamous disappearance are now the stuff of legend. Coming up, who was Antonio Teo? And why he may never have even seen the city he was to design. SA 300 Canary Island Special on KSET is powered by Frost Bank and Sierra Cars Trucks and RVs and the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. The Catholic Church has always played a vital role in Spanish culture as well as colonial expansion. And this amazing cathedral of Santa Ana here in the Canary Islands has been a center point for more than 500 years. And when those very first settlers came to San Antonio and put down their roots, it all centered around a cathedral just like this one, our church, San Fernando. I am standing beneath the dome of the original chapel at the San Fernando Cathedral, one of the oldest cathedrals in North America. It has become famous for its longevity and its beauty, but there's a little known story about it. Its very beginnings involved a murder mystery, one that might be worthy of a defender's investigation today. Here's Dylan Collier. San Fernando Cathedral was already a church with worshipers when Antonio Teo arrived around 1731 to begin his work on behalf of the King of Spain to build a new city for the government in the New World. It was called La Villa de San Fernando, so that means the town was called San Fernando. The church was named after Mary, but under two titles, the European title and the New World title. So you had this long name for the church, La Iglesia de Nuestra Señora de Candelaria y de Guadalupe. That's what you call being PC in those days. No matter what you called it, it became the soul of the city, a monument, a cornerstone, an anchor for modern civilization in the New West. But Antonio Tello was a man who not only loved to build, he loved two other things as well. Mr. Theo, he was a great uh, master mason, but he loved women and wine. And that little incident and mixture landed him in a very bad situation. Edward Weizar is a part-time family historian. He says poring over documents in the Bear County Courthouse revealed that soon after the original Canary Island builder arrived in San Antonio, he was caught up in an inappropriate relationship with an army soldier's wife, Rosa. How it ended is a question murder investigators never clearly answered. Weizar thinks the army soldier, Matias Trevino, arrived home and caught Teo the builder and his wife in the act. Rosa! And drew his gun. Theo was able to disarm the unlucky soldier. Fires one fatal shot and ends his life. So what does he do? He jumps out the window onto the dead man's horse and rides off and never to return again to Texas. But 
the defenders have found documented reports from that time which tell it a different way. Very detailed police reports from 1744 include the soldier's own testimony as he lay dying, that his wife, Rosa, had threatened to kill him when confronted about the affair with Mason Teo. He said Teo lured him into the woods and shot him without warning. With other witnesses backing up the story of her infidelity, Rosa was taken in on suspicion of murder for planning the deadly ambush. Teo, meantime, disappeared into a sanctuary, none other than our own Alamo, where he was safe from arrest. His deposition states he admitted he shot Matias accidentally. Then after investigators left, he somehow slipped away and was gone forever, never to be heard from again. His lover took the rap. Rosa was arrested for murder. But since there was no women's jail in those early years of San Antonio, she was imprisoned in a home, and all record of her fate ends there. A murder mystery in the wild, wild west of San Antonio de Valero. For the defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. So he needed to go to confession, basically. <laughs> the man who made it his job to bring San Fernando's rich history back to life in a huge restoration project 20 years ago says he is not surprised by this. It was a small village, obviously, at the time. The Canary Islanders were like 16 families, and it was a very close-knit group. Everybody built their little, their little huts, their little um, homes right around the center of what we now know Main Plaza all centered around his beloved church. Suffice it to say, the man who created it all, Teo, likely never would return to see it finished. And that is where the Weezer family story begins. The King of Spain had to make some decisions. He had a murder mystery on his hands and a missing master mason. He needed to continue the construction of his colony. Enter Don Pedro Huizar, a Renaissance man whose ideas certainly have transformed San Antonio. 16 years goes by and my great, great, great grandfather is now summoned before the king and is told he's going to be reporting to the Nuevo Spain in San Antonio de Valero. He is given the job to finish what was started, San Fernando, the governor's mansion, the courthouse, the Alamo, and the rest of the missions, La Bahia and more, with roads leading to all of them. Ground zero, the nucleus, not just of San Antonio, but the westward expansion and the first cowboy all came from this area. This is the beginning. According to scrolls buried deep in San Antonio archives, a picture emerges of how this Nuevo España took shape. Don Pedro Huizar would map out a new city from the Alamo area to the missions, San Jose, Concepcion, Espada, La Bahia, and even the aqueducts. The quarrying of the stone that came from the Sunken Garden area and was transported by mule and carriage to the river where the Brackenridge Park is at and float it down, downstream and would be used, same stone would be used to build uh, the Alamo. That's why all the missions are built right alongside the river. Among Don Pedro's contributions, that famous rose window at San Jose, which today is a symbol of San Antonio to the world. Our family would, in fact, call these grounds here at Mission San Jose their home for more than a century. Some of their ancestors are even buried here in this small grave site. Coming up, we're going to take a closer look at the impact of the Canary Islands on San Antonio and the United States, including how we decorate and especially what we eat. SA300 Canary Island Special on KSET is powered by Frost Bank and Sierra Cars Trucks and RVs and the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. The San Antonio Riverwalk was not here, at least not in this form, when the Canary Islanders arrived in the 1700s. They came from a somewhat desolate place, but some spots were lush. In fact, some of the Canary Island plants 
are quite unique to those islands, but were brought here and they've had an impact on how we look and what we eat. Our beloved puffy tacos and tortilla soup all need a little Canary Island kitchen love stirred into the recipe to be real Tex-Mex. Had the Canary Islanders not come to Texas, our food apparently would lose a lot of its zing. Camino and cilantro were staples from their homes and we find that those seasonings originate from Africa. Uh, when the Canary Islanders came, um, they brought with them their staples. Camino, cumin, and cilantro and introduced it to what we now call Texas. That's right, cumin and cilantro are not Mexican spices, they are contributions from our Canary Island ancestors. And that's another cultural contribution of the Canary Islanders to not just Texas, but also the Southwest United States. Carne guisada, forget it, it wouldn't be the same. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the plants that are original to the Canary Islands are the result of isolation on volcanic soil. In other words, the more than 1,000 plants found originally here evolved in solitude over thousands of years. Another reason the National Park is a World Heritage Center. The ichium, that is a plant that is as, as tall as I, as I am, even taller, and it is uh, blood red. Some plants here are just so spectacular, video doesn't do them justice. However, others, like the canary palm here, you can find this in nearly every zip code in San Antonio and across the United States for that matter. You have them all over the islands. It's, it has been, it's our best ambassador. Canary palm has been planted all over, even in California, it's very popular. Aside from the historical implications of the Canary Islands on San Antonio and Texas, it's actually got a major problem today, a problem that could potentially devastate some parts of the United States, including European airspace. All you have to do is look deeply into the eye of its volcano. Here's Adam Kasky. Mount Tiede at 12,000 feet is the third highest volcano in the world but it's what's going on about 40,000 feet below the Earth's surface that poses the greatest danger to the rest of the world. In fact, just last year, Canary Islanders were begged to remain calm amid concerns that this UNESCO World Heritage Site was about to blow. 92 micro earthquakes started a panic, and for good reason. An eruption and plate shift could cause what scientists predict would be a monster tsunami. There would be pretty significant destruction. Low-lying areas, especially like uh, Florida, major cities. In fact, she says researchers estimate a mountain of a wave, the largest in history, would hit not only England, but our very own East Coast. Think of, for example, Mount St. Helens and the landslide that actually triggered the eruption. You know, volcanoes, mountains fall apart every so often. and. Um, when it's near a body of water, it can create a large wave. Some people estimate wave heights of 50 meters, which is pretty astounding. It could be quite devastating. And remember the eruption of the volcano in Iceland in 2010? It shut down air traffic in the skies above 20 countries in Europe, affecting an estimated 20 million travelers. If Mount Tiede decides it's time to blow, the ash emitted would do the same, if not more damage. So in the world of geoscience and economics, Tiede is a big player and always a point of curiosity for its potential destruction and beauty. Meteorologist Adam Kasky, KSAT 12 News. So what does this huge dog have to do with the Canary Islands? Coming up, I am gonna show you how he actually named them. SA300 Canary Island Special on KSET is powered by Frost Bank and Sierra Cars Trucks and RVs and the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. Here's a little bit of trivia for you. If you think the Canary Islands were actually named after those little yellow birds, the canary bird, well, you'd be wrong. Actually, the first early settlers of the Canary Islands came across this, a huge dog, and it made such a big impression, they named the islands after him. In South Texas, we have our chupacabra. In the Canary Islands, though, they have this, 
the Perro de Presa Canario, or otherwise known as the Canary Mastiff. So Latin word, they come can canis. And after that, all the ancient uh, people that come here, the conquerors, they put the name Canary Islands about the cans. They, they, they a lot of dogs here, they were originally from here. To truly appreciate them, you must see them in person. They are remarkably large and imposing. And like the Chupacabra, it's built into the mythology of the region and history of the Canary Islands. Ancient writings credit it as a phenomenal cattle dog, but it was also feared in the wild because it attacked livestock herds too. It's about the jaw. It, 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 it comes like this, the jaw of the, the dog over here. And it's a big dog. It's a brown or dark hair, and it's, it's a big dog. Eh? You must be aware about the dog <laughs> here. Indeed. Imagine a pit bull. Cross it with a bit of Great Dane. Then add in some serious bulldog and mastiff. And you may well have this. Up, up, up. Up, up. Good boy. There you go. Tongo, a Spanish champ that is nearly as tall as me, easily outweighs me. If he were not so sweet and slobbery, the Perro de Preso Canario would be frightening. Early settlers of the Canary Islands had permission to kill these dogs on sight, but they quickly figured out that domesticated Canarios were to be treasured. You need to be prepared for them never to look or do what you want them to do, like they are now. Uh, they're very stubborn, but they're very, very loyal. You need to be prepared for a lot of slobber. Matt Stanton fell in love with the Presa Canario at first sight. He is one of just a few breeders of this rare dog in the United States. And by pure coincidence, is located right outside of San Antonio in Dripping Springs and Spicewood. He has filled his hill country kennels with champion show dogs from the Canary Islands. But this one may be the very first U.S., much less Texas bred, dog to win Spanish champion. Today, memorials to the impressive Canary Mastiff stand guard in the beautiful plaza that overlooks the Cathedral de Santa Ana in Gran Canaria. In fact, statues and sculptures are scattered throughout the islands, and you can't help but notice the number of real dogs you'll still find here too, of all shapes and sizes. It's a major cultural part of island life on Gran Canaria. And while they're all celebrated, it's the big Presa Canario that is rich with history. Smart. Strong, loyal, and imposing. The Presa Canario is one respected dog in the right hands, but no doubt a terrifying prospect in the wrong ones. Our founding fathers of San Antonio shared a lot with traditional Texans. For instance, they raised cattle and they were good at it. They also shared a language, obviously Spanish. That was the language of the land. But there is one other language that you probably have never heard before. This is not a call for attention. This is talking, the type of talking only a Canary Islander of a certain island can speak. Supposedly the islands are so spread apart, whistling, they whistle. And if you research that, every whistle, every tune means something. And they can, families can talk to each other whistling. It's called El Silbo, or the whistle. Researching on the internet provides many examples. It has everything the Spanish language has, verbs, nouns, and emotion. It dates back to the Spanish settlement in the 16th century of the Canary Islands, but specifically on the most remote island, Gomero. El Gomero, with its rural jungle and volcanic landscape, made travel difficult for these islanders. Instead of shouting to the neighbors, they whistled, a sound that carried farther. 
It came in handy. When invaders would inevitably show up over the centuries, islanders could whistle a warning to each other in this private language, and no foreigner would be the wiser. The language all but died on the island, but now it's coming back, taught in classrooms. Vamos a ver, Fátima, tú vas a llamar por Cristian. Dile, levántate y cierra la ventana. Bien, Cristian, contéstale. Bueno, bueno, ya voy para allá. Part of the UNESCO World Heritage effort to conserve a special tradition. Many Canary Island children study Spanish, but also Silbo. Now, with new generations learning El Silbo, there's new hope that this nearly lost manner of communication will be kept alive, especially for the San Antonio Canary Island descendants, who are hoping this tricentennial year will finally be the moment they get to hear it in person. And I would love to hear that, because they teach that in their schools now. They're teaching the little kids whistling. And that, to me, that's interesting. That's very, very interesting. So I'd like to see that. We may one day see and hear that when the Canary Islanders descend upon San Antonio in 2018 for the tricentennial. In fact, we may also see some of their traditional dance, including the dance of the flamenco. That's coming up. Here in San Antonio, our Arneson River Theater is often a perfect backdrop to see some of our traditional folk dancing. The gorgeous dresses and dramatic hairstyles can somewhat be linked to our forefathers in Spain and their traditions of music and dance. Like our ballet folklorico, flamenco remains an important part of nightlife entertainment in Spain, but it's also now considered an art form that needs preserving. Here's Jesse de Bollado. It all starts with the cantes, the traditional songs, many so soulful and serious you want to cry. Then there's the compas, the rhythm. Sometimes it's a guitar strumming, sometimes it's clapping by the singers and fellow dancers. Then of course there's el baile flamenco, Emotional, proud, dramatic as any full opera, showing a strength and a grace only a fully trained dancer or ballerina can perform well. These dancers at the Corral de la Moreira in Madrid are larger than life heroes of the dance, masters at the classic flamenco and modern versions too. This place, a famous celebrity hotspot for decades upon decades perhaps the most revered spot for dinner and dance in all of Spain. The rapid-fire movements of these performers, the feet seem to be the only thing moving, requires an athleticism that separates flamenco from other forms of ballet. This dancer says flamenco has always been a part of her life. As long as she can remember, it has defined her as a person and as a professional. It's something that's uh, born naturally. It's not something that is practiced or something that you rehearse. It's something that's born from the heart. Today, the frilly, voluminous dresses are worn mainly for tourists, like our group from San Antonio. It's striking and dramatic. But the purists of today's professional flamenco dancers are more likely to wear a simple jersey dress. No castanets, no shawls, no fans even. Since it's considered a UNESCO heritage masterpiece, there are efforts to preserve flamenco for future generations. Definitely, this is very important for the youth to be able to see this and to translate it and to be able to capture it as a social determining factor within their society. But while we may love and treasure this form of entertainment, it faces extinction by the very culture that created it. 
they say that uh, more foreigners value it more than their own natural people so that we need to help them in cultivating that social influence here in their own country to make the art as valuable as we see it as foreigners for their own people here in Spain. I'm Jesse de Goyado. When the Canary Islanders came to San Antonio to build a city, missions like this one became very important to their spiritual life. They are beautiful missions. There are four of them in a relatively small area. And their job was to convert Native Americans to Catholicism. Well, that job needed a little extra help. And this mission in particular, Mission Concepcion, took it to a whole new level, a mystical level, a spiritual level, and some might say, supernatural. Every year they come, crowding into Mission Concepcion for nearly 300 years now. It's a once a year event intersecting the spirit of the church with the power of nature. An event that was incorporated into the very fabric of the church in 1731 by the first Spanish builders. On August 15th, at approximately 6.30 in the evening, two lights find their spot. A display of architectural magic when the rays of the sun explode through two windows, creating a spotlight on the face of the Blessed Mother Mary and another on the center of the sanctuary floor just beneath its beautiful dome. This church is built as a cross, a cruciform church. So immediately under the dome, the center of the cross where Christ is, is illuminated as well. So you have Mary illuminated, you have Christ illuminated, this double illumination. The Indians would have been just absolutely amazed at it. The Indians Father Garcia is talking about are for whom this mission was built. Although there is no written record, the Spanish Masons, it's believed, used their talents to impress upon the Native Americans they were hoping to convert to Catholicism, the strong supreme power of nature inside a structure they otherwise would never step foot inside, away from the beloved sun. Funneling that light onto important images of the church is an engineering marvel that the man of today may be touched by as well. While other Spanish colonial missions in Texas and California, for example, have solar illuminations that appear on special feast days, Mission Concepcion is different. It is designed to occur at a specific moment of time, on a specific day, August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption of Mary, but again, specifically at 6.30 every year. It's just amazing that the uh, Franciscans who built this mission um, had the knowledge about the sun and what it would do, and um, you just wonder what impact it had on the Indians when they first saw it. It's unclear what, if any, success the Sunbeam special effect had on Spain's attempts to bring more Native American sheep into the fold, but this year it was clear it did move those in the crowd in perhaps a more special way. The double illumination this August was interrupted when a lone cloud on an otherwise bright sunny day obscured the light at just the moment when it should have been brightest. Then, Almost as if sensing our cameras straining to capture it, the sun dramatically and suddenly broke through. It just seemed like it wasn't going to happen, you know, and then all of a sudden it lit up. It lit up and God works in mysterious ways, you know. Janie Rios and her husband Domingo live right across the street from the mission and they come year after year for 30 years now. What brings you back? It's the exhilaration of the illumination, and it's an awesome experience. It's just, you can't describe it. Newcomers do try, though. Yeah, I've been blessed to just be here today. It's such a blessing. I felt it just all over. It's so beautiful. I've come a couple of times to see it, and it's, it's been quite a visual experience. Uh, sort of leaves you kind of uh, breathless. Yes, breathless and very aware, many said. A 300-year-old lesson in nature, God's part in it and our lives. Perhaps not just for August 15th, but every day.
The double illumination is certainly special here at Mission Concepcion, but there are lots of other reasons to visit. The frescoes alone are worth the trip. But if you are planning to come to the double illumination in our tricentennial year of 2018, you might want to make plans early to be here. That's because, of course, as we're celebrating our 300th birthday, this is sure to be one packed event. Coming up, I'm going to tell you why our own San Antonio delegation traveled all the way to the Canary Islands to prepare for the tricentennial. SA300 Canary Island Special on KSET is powered by Frost Bank and Sierra Cars Trucks and RVs and the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. Just like Texas, or should I say Tejas, Canary Islanders have their own way of saying things and naming things. Probably the most popular locale in this entire island group has a name that's worth taking a look at. Tenerife, or is it Tenerife? Here's Justin Horn. In Texas, there's Mancha, or is it Manchaca? Guadalupe, or Guadalupe? In the Canary Islands, the question always is, is it Tenerife or Tenerife? Tenerife. Tenerife. Yeah, in German, you can say Tenerife. Uh, so you, have, you must say Tenerife. If I go to your country, I, I don't want to say Miami or Miami. Uh, maybe it's Miami. You know? Or Texas, you know, Texas, you know, Texas with a Mexican accent, you know. Your sound is not from here, my friend. <laughs> it's a good explanation, but not all agree. Tenerife. 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 You know, Nobody says Tenerife. No matter how you say it, Tenerife is the largest and most populated island of the seven Canary Islands. About five million tourists visit Tenerife each year, which is the most of any of the Canary Islands. Like our fiesta, it has one of the world's largest carnivals, the Carnival of Santa Cruz de Tenerife. As for where its name came from, ancient Romans referred to this beautiful and diverse island initially as Navaria, Latin from the word meaning snow, referring to the huge snow-covered Tieri volcano. Later, natives of La Palma named the island from two words, Tene, which means mountains, and Ife, which means white. When the Spanish came to colonize, the Hispanic language added an R, using the two words. And that's how... In Spanish you say Tenerife, and in English you say Tenerife. In English, Tenerife, and in Spanish, Tenerife. Tenerife. Was born the island it is today. Justin Horn, KSAT 12 News. It is hoped that the people of Tenerife, or Tenerife, decide to come to San Antonio during the tricentennial year, leaving their private paradise to come to ours. That's because we have a year's worth of celebrating to do. There'll be events all year long, something for everyone. And it all starts off with a huge New Year's Eve celebration. Here's David Sears. So how do you throw a party, let's say, 300 times bigger than Fiesta? Now you start planning a few years early. The new year is the kickoff. We will be activating eight acres of downtown San Antonio, including the first use of Civic Park. It will include a fireworks display that's very exciting and talent. We're working through that now, so we don't have that ready to announce, but here in the next couple of weeks, we will. Stand by for that. There are more than 500 events planned for the remainder of the year, from classroom lessons on our Canary Island history to even a Spain versus U.S. polo match. That would be a goal! And as we hinted earlier, the city has gone to great lengths to bring in Vatican and Spanish royalty, but also international leaders from around the world. We know, for instance, to date, that we are going to have representations from the city of Wuxi in China, Guangzhou in South Korea. We're going to have from Chennai in India, Windhoek in Namibia, Darmstadt in Germany. We expect to have representation from Guadalajara and Monterrey. And of course, a full contingent of Canary Island leaders are coming as well. Part of a traveling invitation that has been rolling from one continent to another for several years. This meeting, an example of the shared desire to make this party as much for U.S. citizens as for Canary Islanders. Then there's the rollout of the educational programs aimed at making sure every student, young or old, 
is aware of our city's history and heritage. There will be mobile apps, uh, all forms of pedagogical engagement in teacher speak. That means helping teachers to translate the message into doable lessons plans and for families and their children at home to be engaged. And then there is the art. Lasting displays of creative genius are being commissioned across the city with one in particular that is expected to actually become a tourism draw to the center of the city. This plethora uh, by a Spanish artist who's been commissioned, who is actually relocating to San Antonio uh, later this year to create this historic piece. And it is six stories tall and it will be dedicated on the 5th of 2018 as part of Legacy Day. And finally, there are literally more than 300 nonprofit organizations and partners who are planning their own personal or explosive event to celebrate San Antonio's 300 years as a vibrant city. For example, the Canary Island descendants will be dressing up for the tricentennial. Our organization is preparing for a reenactment, and this reenactment will focus on the four founding communities of San Antonio the birth, if you will, of San Antonio by including the Native Americans, the Spanish Presidio soldiers, the Spanish friars, as that is the basis and the foundation of the spiritual life of our ancestors, and then of course the arrival of the Canary Island descendants themselves. A party you need to begin making plans for right now. David Sears, KSAT 12 News. SA300 Canary Island Special on KSAT is powered by Frost Bank and Sierra Cars, Trucks and RVs and the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. And there you have it, a party three centuries in the making. I hope you've enjoyed our look inside the birth of San Antonio. I'm Ursula Perry. Thanks so much for joining us. KSAT 12 is your official tricentennial station celebrating San Antonio's culture and history. Our city will be 300 years old in 2018. It's a celebration 300 years in the making. And we at KSAT 12 couldn't be more proud to be a part of the tricentennial festivities. There will be exciting and engaging events that hundreds of thousands of residents and visitors will be able to enjoy. And you'll see it all on KSAT 12 and all of our digital platforms. Together we'll explore, discover, celebrate. And look to the future of our great city. And we invite you to come along. Our coverage on KSAT 12 will range from hour-long programs to news coverage, special 300th birthday celebrations on SA Live, and live fireworks specials that will illuminate the skies over the Alamo City many times. All that on KSAT 12, KSAT.com, and all our social platforms that reach over 1 million people. will prominently feature several interactive elements that spotlight arts, the culture, community service. Our fair city is already visited by millions every year. But now with our World Heritage missions, our newfound foodie culture, the renovation of Hemisphere, and the creation of San Pedro Creek into a river lock for locals, we couldn't think of a better time to shine the light on San Antonio. This is your chance to shine along with the city. Come, be a part of SA300 on KSAT 12. It's too important to sit on the sidelines. It's too important to sit on the sidelines. It's too important to sit on the sidelines. Join, Join us for this once-in-a-lifetime anniversary. anniversary.